God, what would you have us do? Who are you calling us to be? We follow Jesus here. We fulfill God's mission here. Hello, SCC. Thank you for being a part of our gathering today. Our mission here at Shoreline Community Church is to become and make disciples of Jesus as we gather, we grow, and we go. If you want to get connected with us at SCC this fall, download the Church Center app or visit us at shorelinecc.com. You'll find info there about upcoming events, and you can learn how to join a team or engage in giving. You'll also find our Connect card on the Church Center app or by scanning this QR code. The Connect card is a great way to share a prayer need or a praise with our team. You can also use the Connect card to ask for more info about things like baptisms, membership, or giving. If you're a new guest here, bring your Connect card to our lobby or welcome table where we have a special gift for you. Now, check out a few things that are coming up at SCC this fall. Next Sunday, deck the halls! After the gathering, we'll be decorating the church for Advent and Christmas. We'll start with lunch in the chapel and then we'll get to work. Be sure to join for a fun time of listening to Christmas music, decorating together, and decking those halls with boughs of holly. We'll see you there. Next week, we're gonna kick off our local missions event for Christmas in December with our giving tree. It's for Vision House, and keep an eye out for the tree in the lobby as we do deck the halls with tags on it with different gifts for Vision House itself. Hey, this is an announcement for all the Shoreline Community Church men. I'm so excited because on Saturday morning, December 2nd at 9 a.m., we're gonna be having an SCC men's breakfast. You know, one of the things I keep hearing from all the guys is we just wanna get together and hang out and have bacon and coffee together. So we're gonna add some pancakes and some eggs to that. Help us out by going to the Shoreline Community Church Center app and registering so that we know that you will be there so we can make sure that we do not run out of bacon. So again, SCC men's breakfast Saturday morning December 2nd at 9 a.m. Please sign up and I can't wait to see you there. Thank you so much for faithfully supporting our community through your prayers, your finances, and your time. Everyone, you thanks for joining us for real week four. Uh, lives here the in Shoreline last week of the sermon the series, Loving the you City, can give in the as offering. we head into Thanksgiving next week. So, hey, thanks for joining us, and I hope you're enjoying the series. You know, just as by way of recap, if you're with us, you know, week one, we had Pastor Ravon from Union Gospel Mission here, incredible, talking about homelessness, one of the key challenges in the city and the opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, that was so powerful. Week two, we talked about uh, why, why we should love the city. And we focused on Jeremiah 29.7, where the response from God to the Israelites in exile was, seek the welfare of the city for in it you find your own welfare. And then last week we talked about reaching out and how we reach out, focusing on a lot of the research that came from Barna Institute with David Kinneman as they, they, as they uh, brought the data that I think a lot of us know that, that what we're talking about is the importance of being a resilient disciple. That's not just agreeing with Jesus, but it's that resiliency. And we, 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 we looked at a lot of the rates and, and uh, the importance of, of being, re being resilient. We, and if you, if you missed that, be sure to go back and check that out. Um, lots of just depth of, of God's word in that. Now this week, we're talking about the go. If you've been around and you know Shoreline Community Church, we're about gather, grow, and go uh, as we become and make disciples of Jesus Christ. So this week, we're, we're diving into it. And we're going to be using the same scripture as well as many other scriptures from, that we did from last week. But as we start, let's look at this. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. This is towards the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. After Jesus went through the Beatitudes, uh, he focused on this. He looked at them and he said, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled, trampled under people's feet. Verse 14, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, Jesus said, Let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father 
who is in heaven. So what we're going to focus on this today, and we're intentionally going to be focusing on how Jesus went to the city. And, and we're answering the question, how did Jesus go to the city? He told his disciples to go. He spent his life modeling it. So what did that look like in Jesus? Well, the first thing that's, that, uh, that stands out to me as I study the Word of God is that for Jesus, this began with being connected with the church, being connected with the local, what would go on to be the body of Christ. See, Jesus go, it started with the church, and what this meant for him was the, was the, was the temple. And he called the temple his father's house. Luke records in 1947 that Jesus talked about how he taught daily in the temple. And then earlier in Luke chapter 4, it says, When he came to the village of Nazareth, talking about Jesus, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up and read the scriptures. And as we talked about last week, in the early church in Acts 2, it says that they worshiped together at the temple each day, every day, and they met in their homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And, and this is why the writer of Hebrews says that we are to not ever, we're to never give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but we're called to encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So the Bible is very clear that it is essential that a key trait of people who are on mission with God, not their own mission, but they're on mission with God, is that they will be in church faithfully, regularly gathering together. You can count on it. Because after all, in the church, this is where using the analogy of Jesus that we are, we are to be a, a, a light, we're to be this, this, this candle that's lit for the Lord. It's in the church that our lamp gets lit. I mean, as we learned last week, unless we're resilient in our discipleship, we will at worst fall away and at best be ineffective and confusing to those who are trying to find Jesus. See, I need all of you to help me in what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, to fan the flame. 1 Timothy 1.6, Paul says to Timothy, he said, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit of, that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. See, light is always under attack. It's always trying to be snuffed out, blown out, or hidden. And for me, and, for, and what, the, what the, where the Lord is telling us, that, that the church, this is where we come to encourage one another. This is where we come if the light has gone out through the power of the Holy Spirit, other people praying for us, laying hands on us, that the light of Christ comes alive in us. Or to, to trim the wick, you can play with all those candle. This is a candle season, isn't it? Play with all those candles, what makes a candle light well. And you'll see all those analogies about why it's so important. But here's the bottom line. The bottom line is that we will not be effective. We will not be walking in the way of Jesus without the local church. Because that's where Jesus went. That's where he is. That's what he modeled. That's how he showed us how to live. I mean, this is why the Apostle Paul planted churches wherever he went. The Apostle Paul, uh, he did 13 missionary journeys over the course of 13 years, traveling over 7,000 miles, and that's before there were any planes, trains, automobiles. There were no links back then. Um, and he planted at least 14 churches that we know of. And, and so I'm sure there were more than that, but we know that those churches also went on to reproduce and plant more churches as well. See, Paul knew that the local church, building the local church was essential in sharing the gospel to any community. See, the church is the catalyst that the Lord uses for the gospel in our cities. You know, one of my favorite books as it relates to this is, is a book called The Gospel in a Pluralistic Society written by theologian Leslie Newbigin. And he says it this way. He says, the church is meant to be the hermeneutic, that means the interpretation of the gospel. Listen to that again. The church is meant to be the hermeneutic, that's a theological word, which means interpretation of the gospel. In other words, the church often determines how people see Jesus. The goal of the church was that they would be like mirrors that would reflect who God is. And even from the very beginning, as, as God created his people in Israel, it was meant to glorify and to show the world who God is and how we are to live. That's our call now, all of us believers in Christ, we are to live in such a way and to gather together as the church, the body of Christ, so that the world will know. 
I mean, this is often why um, I think the church often comes under so much attack. And I keep referencing this because there are so many uh, things culturally and even from others that would try to discourage others from coming together. But we need the body of Christ. It is essential. Jesus taught this. Jesus modeled the importance of being connected to the body of Christ. But it doesn't just stop there. Because, see, following Jesus, it doesn't stop just by coming to church or showing up or being here with us online today. When we look at the life of Jesus, that Jesus, he connected with the church, but then he connected on the streets. The streets is wherever he walked. As he walked, Jesus, his head was up. He was looking at people, and he interacted with people in the marketplace or wherever he went. He was constantly, so many of the stories of healing, of restoration, uh, of his teachings these, um, in showing the disciples how to walk, happened as he was walking the streets wherever he was. He interacted with the broken. I mean, look at the, uh, look at the Gospels. You, you'll see how so many of his healings were as he walked in the marketplace or through the streets or in pe- wherever he was. Uh, He paused, he talked with people, he prayed over people as he was going about his day. He interacted with children. Uh, Children were out playing and he often interacted with them. Uh, Jesus, he also connected at work. Uh, one One of the common works of that day was to be a fisherman. Jesus would frequent the shorelines, calling out to fishermen to follow him and to reach him. Uh, He connected with tax collectors at the booth, very unpopular place, but Jesus went there. He connected with merchants in the marketplace. Uh, Jesus, he connected with people in their homes. Uh, He called Zacchaeus out of the tree and even invited himself over to his house. With the tax collector Matthew, Matthew had a party. He invited Jesus to be there so his friends could meet him, so that they could discover the transformation that he was going through. But as we look at Jesus and how he walked and how he connected as he walked the streets, as he walked through the, the, the city, I think it's important to pay attention to the fact that when Jesus looked at people, he looked at people with eyes of love, but also eyes of discernment. See, Jesus, he saw where people were, he saw what they were doing, and he saw how to connect to them. With the tax collector Matthew, Matthew felt isolated and alone. Jesus offered him friendship through going to his house. But one of the, I think one of the big illustrations that really connected with me as I was studying this was the beggar blind Bartimaeus. And we see this in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, 46. It says, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, Have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and he said, Call him. So they called to the blind man and they said, Cheer up on your feet. How quickly they turned from trying to keep him quiet to go, Hey, cheer up. Get on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, just very quickly, I think it's important that we don't miss just a few quick reflection points on this. That first of all, this whole incident happened because first of all, Jesus had proximity. He was close to the beggar, and and his proximity moved to compassion, meaning he rebuked those who tried to silence the beggar. He had compassion for them. And then next, Jesus' compassion, it moved from compassion to confession when Jesus said to the man, what do you want? Now, Jesus knew what he wanted. He wasn't blind to his condition, but the man needed to be willing to confess his need. Confession is such an important part. And in his confession, the confession moved to generosity. Jesus was generous with the man, and he healed him. And he even connected the man's faith to uh, his healing to his faith when he said, your faith has healed you. See, the truth here is that unless you want it and believe it, you will not receive it. This is the first step of confessing and saying, yes, I want to step out. Yes, I want to move forward with Jesus. And the confession, it moved Jesus to generosity. Jesus is generous, but he never minimizes 
or overlooks the need for our responsibility. And then the generosity of Jesus, it moved to restoration. The man followed Jesus. He was healed. And the healing and provision, and that is not the end. See, it's just the beginning. Because the greater goal was reconciliation for this man. So in this, we see very quickly how the proximity is so important and how it moves us to compassion. And the compassion moves us to confession and confession to generosity and generosity to restoration, being reconciled to God. But as we look at Jesus and how he moved and how he walked, we also see that when Jesus was in the city, he was very entrepreneurial. See, our call to follow the Lord, it's an entrepreneurial call. And I love that because entrepreneurs do two things really well. First of all, entrepreneurs, they see the need. They're really good at seeing what people want about what people need in their lives. But the second part, which is, which is equally important, is that entrepreneurs, they act on it. Entrepreneurs, good entrepreneurs, they take action. They, they proactively take steps to make the most of the opportunity that they've been given. This is from Ephesians chapter 5, when, when, when Paul to the church of Ephesus set, tells him, he says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. See, an entrepreneur is someone who knows how to partner with others and in order to make the, the dreams, what they see, become reality. An entrepreneur is someone who is, they're not stopped by obstacles, but they're able to creatively overcome them even growing stronger and more effective as they do so. See, I believe the Lord is calling us to step out into areas where people are within our city. And as I was reflecting on this, I began to become encouraged because I began to think about what are some of the ways that our community, Shoreline Community Church, SCC, is moving forward in entrepreneurial ways. Well, if you've been been with us, I believe one of the areas that we're starting this journey is in the area of homelessness. If you're with us on week one, you learn that Seattle has the third largest homeless population in the U.S. And I'm so thankful for Union Gospel Mission that we are partnering with them to teach us and to show us how we, how, how, how we can respond to it. We have trainings where they, they teach us on seeing homelessness, identifying it, walking with it. How to walk with people who are experiencing such great trauma in their lives. Now, are we perfect? Well, of course, we're definitely not perfect. But I believe the Lord is opening our eyes. And he's teaching us and he's stirring us in, the, in these areas. And my prayer is that SEC would be a place where everyone feels welcome. And we're learning how to become more effective as it relates to this part of our city. Another area I began to, to reflect on is foster care. When you look at the city of Seattle and the surrounding area, really, really across the U.S., the need for foster care is so great. When you talk to officials in the city, foster care is always in the top list of things that that they're they're trying to help, that they're asking for help. And for us, we partner uh, proudly with Olive Crest. They're one of the organizations that we send monthly financial support to. But more more, more than that, we're also partnering with them by this Thanksgiving. Our church is sending 25 Thanksgiving baskets to foster families. And we already have several families in our church that are active and loving and providing support for for foster families and children. And my prayer is that that would continue to increase. One of the other areas of entrepreneuring uh, in the city of reaching out is our soon-to-be SEC coffee house. I'm so excited about that. And, I, and as I was thinking about this, I, I, uh, I pulled up our Coffeehouse mission statement that says this, that our mission statement is that we would be a first-class, fully operational coffeehouse where the church and the community cross paths. It's a crossroad. We are a local shop that seeks to serve the community of Shoreline and our church body by providing a quality cup of coffee and other products, but friendly service and a place where people can meet others. We operate so that people can connect with others and ultimately connect with God. But we also seek to provide lift opportunities to young people by providing an opportunity to discover their talents and ability through serving our neighborhood, through serving great coffee. Another area that we're, that we're getting ready to step out in, if you've been around, you've, you've heard us talk about our next PAC. PAC stands for Parent Affiliated Church. And I'm so excited to announce that our board has signed off for this next Parent Affiliated Church with Dr. Carl Martin and our partnership with them. This church will, be, will focus on reaching the growing international community in our area and many who are from unreached people groups and unconnected people. And this will also include area colleges and universities. 
We're also going to the city by reaching out to our youth. Pastor Tiffany is working on developing a Wednesday after school connection for teenagers in our area. And she's also working at how we can have, have a presence on our local high school campuses. Dinner Church is one of the uh, effective and growing ministries where it's sharing the love of Jesus over a meal. And I'm so excited about Pastor Sean Rutan and all that he's doing with community dinners and, and connecting them over meals, sharing the love of Christ. We're also looking at this next year of doing more missions trips. We, sir, we currently support over 52 missionaries, both globally and locally. And over the next year, Pastor Stephanie's planning missions trips that will help us in better connecting to the local as well as the global commission from Jesus to go and make disciples. And there are so many other things, things we're dreaming about, things we're actively doing. But in all of this, I think it's important to, to take note that all of this and more requires something of us. And that requirement is commitment. Nothing happens without commitment. Nothing happens without commitment. And we know that the higher the prize, often the higher the cost. See, our effectiveness, our life as a body of Christ is in direct correlation to our willingness to deny ourselves and take on Jesus. We see this throughout Scripture. Matthew 10, 39 says, If we lose our lives, we will gain it. And then John 3, 30 says that he must increase, I must decrease. And I love what, it, what Paul said to the Corinthian church when he said, When I'm weak, then I am strong. Our effectiveness for Christ comes in humbling ourselves, laying it out, surrendering everything. As Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. As a result of this, this has resulted for me in my life. There are, uh, there are three big commitments that I've made to the body of Christ that have changed my life. The first one is to be here. No matter how I feel, no matter what's going on in my life, even when I'm on vacation, I've made a personal commitment to gather together every week with the body of Christ. This is essential in my growth, to gather for our gatherings that here happen on Sunday morning, to gather for our prayer services. That is so important. So I've committed to be here, but I've also committed to be generous in accordance to God's word. I've committed to give. No matter my financial situation, I've made a commitment to, to tithe to, Shirley, to the local church. I've made a commitment to give to missions and to respond to other needs. And this is not based on my current financial situation because this has fluctuated a lot over the year. It's been a commitment to the Lord and the Lord has been faithful. But generosity also includes serving, that I've made a commitment to serve the Lord through the local church. So my three big commitments are to be here, to be generous, but also to be aware. It's important that we are aware of the opportunities that God gives us, whether they're at home or at work or at play. And that means that as I'm aware that, that I share, that I'm always looking for people to share the gospel with in my life. See, knowledge that is not applied diminishes in value. One of my, one of my seminary professors said that I'll never forget it. It is so important that we share that we reflect, that we, that we tell of what God is doing in our lives. This instructs us and shows us. So as we wrap this up today, and as we respond to this, I think those big three would be a great place for us to start in our response, that as you ask yourself, how should I respond today? Maybe it's an increase in commitment to be here, or I should respond by increasing my commitment to be generous through giving and serving. Or perhaps it's increasing my commitment to be aware where I'm looking for opportunities to share my faith. You know, something that we'd love for you to do is we've put together just this very simple survey. And it's a survey uh, called Sharing Jesus Assessment. And what I'd love for you to do is I'd love for you to click on the link or scan the QR code that's going to come up and just take a few moments. It's less than 10 minutes. But I'd love to hear from you as it relates to sharing your faith. Take some time to do that. We'd love to hear from you. It's anonymous, so you can, you can freely and openly, honestly share. But if you would, take a moment and allow it to challenge you in your walk with faith of, Lord, how can I be more effective in sharing your love and your life to those around me? So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you sent somebody to me, someone to us. If we know you, it's because you sent somebody and because you gave your life for us. Now, Lord, as we head into this exciting season ahead, Father, I pray that you would lead us, guide us, and anoint us and enable us to do more, infinitely more than we could ever ask, more than we could ever imagine, and more than we could ever hope 
for through you, I pray. So lead us and speak to us. Lord, we are listening in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's join the worship team now as we worship the Lord together in song. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. Be sure to check out all the events going on. Next week is Thanksgiving. Pastor Harry is going to be here preaching. So excited about it. And then we head into the Advent Christmas season. Be sure you check out all the things going on. So many wonderful things. Men's breakfast. Check it out. We would love to see you in this Christmas season. So before we go, this is our benediction. Let's say this together. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious towards you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now go and live for Jesus. We love you so very much. God bless you all. Bye.